thank you that you are giving us new life through Jesus. And that sweet and amazing gift is available to all. You are a good God who loves his creation and wants to see us ransomed back from our sin and reconciled to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. When my children were young, we were actually just watching some of the home videos last night, and you you reminded of some of the way things were that you don't always recall. But one of the things that I noticed on these videos is there was a number of, of items throughout the house as these videos were being recorded that I hadn't remembered. One was a small wind tunnel vacuum cleaner that matched the vacuum cleaner that we had and used. And, and we had it because... Hannah, our, our oldest at the time, wanted to do what she saw us doing, you know, and so we, we fostered that. It's like, okay, you want, you want to do what we do, so here's your own vacuum, and so whenever Sarah and I were running the vacuum, notice how I said Sarah I because I didn't want to get into trouble of saying it was just Sarah. That's totally why I said that. It was all her. Uh, <clears throat> So while Sarah, I'm just going to say it, while Sarah was running the vacuum, because I just didn't run the vacuum, uh, while Sarah was running the vacuum, Hannah would want to do the same thing. You know, there's, there's this natural, intrinsic thing that's going on there with our kids. When they see what we're doing, they want to do it. Likewise, we had, we, you, I showed the video years ago, we had Isaac was pushing his little bubble-making lawnmower behind me as I'm cutting the grass. You know, they do. You go back and forth. That's all they want to do. They're wanting to do what it is that you're doing. And it's, it's this picture of leadership and followership that kind of goes hand in hand. We're going to look at that this morning. And there's times, honestly, in my life where I, I want my kids to do what I do. And there's times in my life where I don't want you to do what I do. You know what I'm saying? That's a tough that's a tough balance. It's a tough thing to kind of wrestle with and, and work through. Um, but when, in our culture, our culture, basically, we, we hold this esteem for leaders. We like great leaders. And when we look at these great leaders, we just hold them in such a lofty position. Oh, they're such a great leader. And we want people to be great leaders. We're looking, we're stepping into the 2020 election. We're, let's be honest, in America right now, we're not really looking for the great leader as much as we're looking for whoever's electable. You know, that's what it boils down to, which is unfortunate. But even in that capacity, we want the great leader, but we don't always want the greatest follower. We look actually look down on this idea of, of finding someone who's just, oh, they're just a follower. I'm telling you now, get this, depending on who you follow can make all the difference as to whether or not you're a great leader. Does that make sense? Who we follow comes before whether or not we can ever be a good or even a great leader. It starts with following. And that's what we see. We see it through the scriptures. There was, uh, we look at it with Abraham, the father of faith, if you would, in, in the scriptures. Here's this man, Abraham. He's living basically out in this region. And God says to him, Abraham, I want you to take your wife, your kids, your family, etc." which he didn't really have kids yet at that time. I want you to go into the land that I will show you. And so Abraham takes his stuff and he heads off, not knowing where God's going to be taking him, but he's following. He's got to follow somewhere. And Abraham became, in a sense, this founder of Israel, somewhat of a great leader. He was esteemed by generation after generation after generation because of the faith that he had. And where did it start? Did he start suddenly because he went to some leadership seminar and was trained as to how to be a great leader? No, it started with his obedience to follow God when God said, I want you to follow me. We see it in Moses. Moses, perhaps, is, is recognized as the greatest leader of all Israel. He led his, the people out of Egypt and through the desert for 40 years, bringing them finally to the promised land. But even in his life, all Moses did was follow. He followed a pillar of cloud. He followed a pillar of fire. Everything that he did was an act of following what God had laid out for him. Yeah, he was a great leader. But it wasn't because he had great leadership skills. It was, it was because he was a great follower. You see it all the way through the scriptures. You see it in a man named King David. 
And even in, in Saul, this is interesting, back up to King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. And he was commissioned to follow God, and he did. And he fo- how did he follow him? He followed him by, by believing and obeying what the prophets were laying out for Saul and the guidance that he got from God. And that, but then the, something switched, something happened to Saul. He's up on the mountain, and he's supposed to wait for Samuel to come and do the sacrifice. That's what following would look like, wait for me. And when, when Samuel comes, he'll do the sacrifice. But instead, Saul says, I'm not willing to follow anymore. These people, these Israelites need a leader. I'm going to be that leader. And he takes it onto himself and he makes the sacrifice on his own. And instead of following, he says, no, these people need a leader. I'm going to lead. And so he leads without following. And it was his demise. You see where we're going? I mean, this is really interesting stuff. Look at it this way. Every one of us, we're following someone. Every one of us is following someone. We may not be aware of it, but somewhere as we've been growing up, we've been influenced by people. We're following someone. And I want us to be able to take some time and reflect on who is it really that I'm following? That's a, that's a big question because who we follow determines who we will become. And so we look at these, some of these uh, stories here. Do you, anyone know who Norman Vincent Peale is? Do you? Good. Very few. Very few of us know who Norman Vincent Peale is. Let's be honest, right? Old time, early 1900s pastor. But what's so interesting about this guy is that he had a huge influence on this guy. And most all of us have heard of who Billy Graham is. You see? You know, Billy Graham obviously was a follower of Christ, but even before that or in the midst of that, he had other people that were influencing him. This Norman Vincent Peale was one of the guys who had a huge impact on Billy Graham. Billy Graham was who he was because of his ability to follow, obviously, the Lord, but also people, godly people that he put into his life. And this is what Billy Graham says about that Norman Peale. He says, I don't know of anyone who had done more for the kingdom of God than Norman and Ruth Peale or have meant any more in my life for the encouragement they have given me. That's a pretty powerful statement coming from Billy Graham, wouldn't you think? Who Billy Graham followed directly affected who he became. And it's interesting here, who is this here? George W. Bush. Remember here, George W. Bush, two-time American president? This is what George W. Bush has to say about Billy Graham. He says, as a result of being with Billy Graham and being inspired by Billy Graham, and I guess being led by Billy Graham. Isn't that interesting? Because Billy Graham is following someone, and now we see Billy Graham is also a leader of someone. You see the anomaly that we're kind of wrestling with here? Both pictures come into play. And I guess being led by Billy Graham, I started reading the Bible, and shortly thereafter, I quit drinking. It shows the impact that Billy Graham had on George W. Bush. And one other interesting thing to state And this is kind of what I started with, with this idea of, this is a quote from Billy Graham as well, and it says, every parent needs to consider carefully the impact of their influence. That's a humbling picture to consider how much our kids are watching and doing what we do. Hmm. So there's another guy in the scripture we find named Peter. We've been talking about through the book of Acts, and we see Peter has come up to... uh, in the conversation a number of times. He's a great leader in the New Testament church. We see Peter is the one that he's going into these other places. We saw him just last week when he was the one that went with John into Samaria to kind of make sure that everything was being established correct in the Samarian uh, culture, in the, in the Samaritans for, for them to establish their church. So Peter goes in and he's recognizing something's not right here and he kind of rectifies some of those things. He's a great leader in the New Testament church. Peter is. But we look at when he, we'll come back to this here in a second. We look at when he he chose to follow Christ. Look at this. Back in John 1, this is the very moment, and what you see in this capacity is you see this picture of Peter being called to follow as well as called to lead, and they go hand in hand. It says, turning around, this was Jesus now, saw them following him. So Jesus had just been baptized. He's coming onto the scene here, and there's some guys who were John the Baptist followers, and now they see Jesus coming in. John the Baptist is the one that said, he pointed to Jesus said, hey, behold, look at this guy. Behold the Lamb of God. I'm not even worthy to tie and untie his sandals. That guy is so great. And so some of John the Baptist's disciples actually leave John the Baptist and start following Jesus Christ. And that's what we're seeing here. And Jesus turns around and sees these guys following. and says, what is it that you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? In other words, where are you going? 
And Jesus' response is, come. In other words, follow me. I'll show you where I'm going to be staying. And you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. So, okay, catch the, the phrasing there. Simon Peter's brother was one of these guys that followed. They went to Jesus. They followed him. They heard what, what John the Baptist said, which was, behold, the Lamb of God. And the first thing Andrew did was tell his brother Simon, this is Peter, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah that is the Christ. And he brought Peter to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, in other words, rock. And then we fast forward to the end of that same gospel. That's how the gospel started. This is the end of that same gospel. We find this encounter with Peter. If you know Peter's story, what ended up happening, he was a follower of Christ throughout the whole time that Jesus had this earthly ministry. Well, it came time when they're at the Last Supper and Jesus says, one of you is going to deny me. And Peter says, nah, -uh, not going to be me. Even if everyone else does, I'm not going to do it. And Jesus says, yes, you are. And he says, no, I'm not. And he says, yes, you are. And he says, no, I'm not. Reminds you of the drive you had home from St. Cloud the other day, doesn't it? And basically what we find is Jesus was right, Peter was wrong, and Peter did deny Jesus three times before the rooster crowed that morning. He's devastated. Peter, it's, the scriptures say Peter went away and wept bitterly because he knew he messed up. He had not followed Jesus well like he had said he would. And this is the point where now Jesus is encountering Peter and he's going to reinstate him. He's going to kind of restore this relationship. And so there's three times that Jesus ends up asking, he says, Peter, do you love me? And there's words in there. We're not going to get into that now. And Peter ends up saying, yes, Lord, I love you. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep, et cetera, et cetera. We get to the third time. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. He was hurt. He was already dealing with that pain that he had rejected him, that he had messed up. He's hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. And very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. This is talking about his, Peter's death. So in other words, he's saying basically, guess what? You keep following me you're going to die in a way that you don't want to die. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. It's interesting if we look at some of those other scriptures, Peter's first response after that, it says, well, what about him? And he says, that's not your concern. You follow me. Peter becomes a great leader in the New Testament church. It's not because he went to a leadership seminar. It's not because he had great leadership skills. It's because Why? He learned how to follow Christ well. And that's what we're going to see as we step into this book of Acts and we look at this character, Philip, again. If you remember, uh, this is where Paul lays it out for us. This is, kind of, this is our theme, I would say, for the, day, for the day. Paul, who we're going to actually talk about next week, he's converted. We talked about him briefly last week. He started persecuting the church. Paul writes this later to the Corinthians, and he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, follow me as I follow Christ. I'd like to be able to say that every day. And I don't think I can say that every day. But I will do my best to be able to follow Christ so that I can say that on a daily basis. So that's kind of a theme that revolves around it. So here we go. Uh, Acts chapter 8. But when they believed Philip, this is looking back to last week. So Philip is in the Samaritan area. Things are going well for him. A lot of people are choosing to follow Christ. Things, I mean, it's a good ministry he's got going on there. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. We'll talk a little bit more about that baptism. We're going to say that word baptism or baptized is going to come up again today in this story. But this, this shows this picture. People are coming to Christ. Philip is a leader. He's the one that's, that's there in Samaria, Samaria, Samaritan, and he is leading the people and he's leading the people to Christ. He's a leader. But why is he a leader? Because he knows how to follow. After 
they had further proclaimed the word. This is verse 25. This is how we left it off last week, right at the very end. I've probably even skipped this verse, so we're getting back to it today. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching, in the, preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan villages. So you saw, we saw how the gospel had spread. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read it. We've, we've hit it over and over again. That's the main theme verse of the whole book of Acts. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, and you will be my witnesses, and it'll start in Jerusalem, which was the city. It'll go into Judea, which is the, the region, and then it's going to be in Samaria, which is broader yet, and to the very ends of the earth. Guess what today is coming today? The very ends of the earth, and I mean that in a very literal fashion in their belief in that culture. Okay. Help. It's not working, Kim. Verse 26. Unless I've got this slide repeated over and over again. There we go. Okay. Now an angel of the Lord. So this is where we start in. Here was Philip in Samaria. Things are going well for him. Okay. And now what we find is God's changing some things. An angel of the Lord appears to Philip and he says, go south to the road, the desert road. And it's interesting, I've heard some people kind of talk about, you know, commentaries and even preachers and such on this passage. Maybe there's something here, but it's interesting how God has taken Philip from a very comfortable and thriving ministry and he sends him out into the desert road. And some people will play on that pretty heavily. And there might be some validity there. Go, out to, go to the south, go to the road, go to the desert road. You know, it goes from a, a place of great harvest to a place that's very dry. And sometimes God takes us maybe where we don't think we want to go, but he's got a bigger purpose in mind. We're going to see that here. Go to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Thank you. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So here's what we have. We have this Ethiopian, the far regions to the south, and quite literally, when we look at how this area is described, you find it in Greek culture, you find it in the, the Septuagint, which is probably what this guy would be reading. We're going to see that in a little bit. They would have thought, and I mean this very literal in the language that's used, that Ethiopia was noted to be the very ends of the earth. And that's, that's how, what they would have been known as to the very ends of the earth. And so then you take what we just read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and it's like, wow, the gospel already so quickly has moved from Jerusalem and has already gone out. And what's interesting, I was talking to the elders about this too, and we have, we have evidence and there's readings. The, the Ethiopian church that was started here when that gospel spread is still thriving today. It's astounding. And how quickly that gospel spread. And you see what Jesus had foretold is coming to pass. And it happens through divine appointments that he has. So basically here it is. Philip is called to go out. He meets this guy who's from the very ends of the earth. This guy is going to be going down there uh, later on. We'll see kind of it alluded to. And that's all we got about this guy. So this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So this Ethiopian is one of two things. Either he is a full-fledged convert to Judaism, that's possible, or he is at least a God-fearing Gentile. Does that make sense? So he's got to be one of those two where he actually made this trek, which is quite a few miles up from Ethiopia into Jerusalem so that he could worship. He recognized that God is bigger. He recognized that God is sovereign. Now, whether he was fully converted to Judaism, we don't know. But he's reading the scriptures. That could have been Hebrew. That could have been Greek. Most likely, it was probably a Greek translation of the scriptures that he was reading. And there's some evidence as to why that is, too. I'm not going to bore you with that right now. And it reminds us of what we just talked about. This is where that gospel is going to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the very ends of the earth. And on his way home, this man was sitting in his chariot, and he's reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. So here's this Ethiopian from the nether regions of the world, and he's sitting in this chariot as this chariot is going, and he's reading. We're going to see that he's actually going to be reading out loud. Now, whether he's reading it himself, we don't know. He's a very important official, so it's very possible that he had someone else actually in the chariot reading to him. But either way, it was custom to actually read out loud in that culture. For us, it's like, well, stop reading out loud because it's distracting me from my own reading, you know, so we read quietly. That's what we do, but in this culture, it was very common. In fact, it would be very uncommon to not be reading out loud. When something was read, it was read out loud. And so here he is on the chariot, whether he's reading it himself out loud or whether someone's reading it to him out loud. The reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. 
The Spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. <coughs> Philip had a choice. And that first time when the angel appeared to him and said, hey, go on the road, the desert road. I need you to go south. Philip could have said, no, I don't think so. Things are going really well here. I'd like to stay. He had the choice. He chose to follow. Likewise, in the same capacity, the Spirit is leading him to the Ethiopian. The Ethiopians, we talked about the Samaritans and the, the Jews. They didn't get along. These people, racism would have been rampant. And they looked at these people from the ends of the earth like, we don't associate with them. There was such polarity existing. And so the Spirit says, I want you to go up to that chariot where that man is sitting who you kind of despise, and I want you to just stay near it. Philip doesn't have to go. There's nothing that makes Philip have to go there, but instead, what does Philip do? What makes him a great leader is the fact that he's a great follower. And he says, okay, and he follows, and he goes and stays near the chariot. And then what we see is happening is then Philip ran up to the chariot. Not only does he go, but he actually runs to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And then this is, this, this is a divine appointment. This is God orchestrated. Understand this. God knew everything that was going on here before it ever happened. You ever be in those situations where you find yourself like, wow, why did this happen? Why are you here right here when I knew? Why did you say what you just said? You find yourself in this moment where you know that was a God divine moment. God divine interaction is like, that's why we're here. I've heard people say that to me in different capacities where they say, you know, I came and I, I heard this happen and it's like I knew that's, that's what God has for me. There was this divine, God was doing something crazy. I know sometimes it's hard for us to believe God was doing something crazy and he was calling me to that. You know, I remember I was, I was at a Promise Keepers. I graduated high school. I don't think I had started college yet, so I think it was 1994. I got into this Promise Keepers and it's huge, you know, it's down at the Metrodome. They don't have Promise Keepers at the Metrodome anymore. You want to know why? They tore the building down. That's why. It'd be very cold. So, we had this Promise Keepers down at the Metrodome full of all these guys in there and I, there's a guy speaking. I have no idea what he said. Nothing. The, the sound was so bad whether he was mumbling, I have no idea what he said. But there was a divine moment in my life at that point where I felt like the Lord was saying, Ryan, I need to have business with you. And I actually went down at that time. And like I said, I don't know a word that that guy spoke. It has nothing to do with it. But God had a divine, catch this now. So I'm down there on the floor of the Metrodome. There's like 60,000 people. I'm probably exaggerating that. 60,000 people. Who comes up behind me? It is my 10th grade English teacher. I didn't even know he was there. This is that same one that I talked about a couple weeks ago with about the whole idea of forgiveness. Remember that? He came up behind me and he put his hand on me. He was like, who's touching me? <laughs> okay. This is really awkward. There could be a lot of people here. Just please don't touch me. And I turn around and I see it's him. There's this divine appointment where God has us like, seriously? How does that work? I'm telling you, that's what we're looking at here with Philip and this Ethiopian. Here's this Ethiopian traveling from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. And God leads Philip to go there for this divine appointment because God's got something major that he wants to have happen right here. And it can happen. No matter how great of a leader Philip is, it can't happen unless Philip's a great follower. Do you hear that? I mean, can you see that in there? And so here's Philip, this great follower. He goes up to the chariot for this divine appointment. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? Simple question. You ever wonder how you're, how, I don't, I can't share the, the, my, the, my faith. That, that's really scary. I can't share, share the gospel. That's all, we know what Philip did. He says, do you understand what you're reading? That's all he said. And the guy's answer is wonderful. I just love his answer. Oop, too far. There you go. How can I understand? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. Well, <laughs> let me explain it to you. So he invited Philip to come and sit down with him. So here goes Philip into this chariot to explain what it is that he's reading. I love this question. So this passage of scripture, the eunuch was reading was, he was led, talk about divine appointment. This is what he was reading out loud when Philip came. And those who know your Old Testament, those who know your Old Testament prophecy in particular, this is perhaps the most profound prophetic statement writing that we have from Isaiah that points to who Jesus was. 
I mean, it's just like, wow, that fits incredibly well. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing the way it fits. And so here's this Ethiopian reading at this time, just as Philip is coming up to the, the chariot. He hops in, and he's riding with him, and he says, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asks Philip the question, tell me, who is the prophet talking about? What a great question. He says, is he talking about himself or is it someone else? And this led Philip to be able to share the gospel with starting with that very passage of scripture. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And this is that word baptized again. You know, there's some confusion, obviously, as to what we have, what baptism. Baptism does not save anyone. I don't believe we are saved by baptism. You may disagree with me on that, but I'm going to hold to that one. Baptism is this physical demonstration of following Jesus. That's really what it boils down to. And it's very, it started in that culture, and that culture would have understood it very immensely. But this idea of it is why we choose baptism in particular, it means we're immersed with it. We're totally covered with, we're, we're all in, we're engulfed in this idea of what the gospel is. And so that's what that word really means is to be basically immersed in or to be covered in. But what, what happened with this idea of baptism with Jesus Christ is when we were baptized, we are totally aligning ourselves with following him. And what that means is I'm not just following his teaching because a lot of people follow Jesus' teaching, but they're not followers of Christ. I mean, you got to understand the difference. And what it ends up being is someone who chooses to be baptized and they're going with Christ. And by baptizing, I'm aligning myself that, I am, that he died, we go under the water. He rose again, coming up out of the water. And I am aligning that I am covered. My sins are covered. Because I have aligned myself with his death and his resurrection. That's really, baptism is a symbol of following. And so what you have is you have Philip, who's a great follower of Jesus Christ. And as he's following, the Lord is giving him opportunities to lead, if you will. But he's following. That's first and foremost, he's a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as he's following, he's given these opportunities to lead. He leads this Ethiopian to what? To follow. And as this Ethiopian follows, he says, what's preventing me from giving a public display of following? Here, look, there's some water. Now I want everyone to know that I'm today choosing to follow. I don't want just you to know, Philip. I want everyone to know. So he gets out of the chariot, they go down to the water, and they're ba- he's baptized saying, I am aligning myself fully with this gospel of Jesus Christ. I, in other words, he says, I'm a follower. I will follow. And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, and this word gets a little bit weird. I don't know how to help you with this one. We're just going to stay mystified on this here, I think, a little bit. The Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. It's a divine appointment. The eunuch goes down, and it's through his conversion, his choice to follow Christ, that we actually have the gospel spread to the ends of the earth in Ethiopia and beyond. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Because why? Because of great leaders? No, because of great followers. God will use great followers in the capacity of leadership. If you want to become a great leader, stop trying to lead and start trying to follow. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the other towns until he reached Caesarea. So in other words, Philip goes out continuing to follow and letting the Lord use him as he will. So it kind of boils down for us and what we're going to do with this. Um, The first question is, who are you following? You know, and as you look at your life and you reflect, it's like, we're all following someone. I said that from the beginning. I still believe that 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 is true. But who is it that you're following? Who in your life, perhaps, has been so influential? I mean, you could write their name down. They have just been paramount in developing who I am. It could be your parents. You know, let's be honest, you know, gut level honest. Sometimes we're influenced by pe- people, including our parents, in positive ways and negative ways, but they both have a huge effect on who we are and who we've become. You know, who I choose to follow is huge in who I become. Because just because someone has influence on me doesn't mean that I have to follow them. You know, it's like the, the 
the middle school and high school years, you can have all kinds of influences going on you there, right? Teachers, positive and or negative. Your peers, positive or negative. The influences are there. But who will you choose to follow? You know, we have, we have students, we want them to become leaders in their school. Yep, I'm all in favor of that. But where does it start? They got to know who to follow first, don't they? And they have to be committed as to who to follow. In our workplace, who are we going to follow? As parents, who are we going to follow? You have to be able to wrestle with that question. Who is it that you're following? Because right now, I think you may not be able to even identify it. We're, you're following someone. Some of these other great leaders, like Abraham Lincoln. We look at Abraham Lincoln. Oh, he was a great leader. Yes, he was. Heavily influenced by President Fillmore was one of them. Look at, at the character that they had had that preceded him. We all have people that we follow. Adolf Hitler. I started to say, as far as a leader goes, he was a great leader, right? Perhaps one of the greatest followings that anyone had ever known in the history of, of humanity. Who was he influenced by? An anti-Semitic composer. He was, he was so moved by his music and what the man then believed, which was Jews are bad, in a nutshell. He was so heavily influenced that's who he was following. Do you see that? Adolf Hitler was a leader, but even before he was a leader, he had to be a follower. And so we're developed by who we follow. So who are you following? And maybe the better question then to re reflect on is, who will I follow? As the Ethiopian came to the point of, I will follow Christ. And it changed his life. So if we choose to follow Christ... Basically, how do, how do we do that? You know, it's, it's simple to say I'm a follower of Christ. Well, we can't follow unless we know who this person is, unless we know what this person is doing. And I think there's two primary ways, and that's in the Word of God. So if I'm not in the Word of God, how do I know how to follow Him? And the other is the Holy Spirit. And we see both evidenced in this story. Do you see that? The Ethiopian is influenced by the Word of God as he's reading Isaiah out loud. And he's influenced by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's the one that's leading Philip. I just, I want to emphasize, we need to take a fresh look at who we're following. There's some times where I don't, I don't like who I am and where I'm going, and I have to reflect, okay, why is that? It's not, that wouldn't be because I'm following Jesus then, it's because I'm following my own ways. Like Saul, he made that switch. He was a follower of God. And then something, nope. These people need a leader, so I'm going to lead. And he stopped following. You see that? Will you follow Christ? Some of you have chosen to do that and maybe need this, like, you know, you're right, and I, I need to get serious with that again. Some of us maybe have never chosen to follow Christ. Just like that Ethiopian. You've heard the scripture. You've heard the leading and felt the leading of the Holy Spirit. What's preventing you? Why should you not be a follower of Christ today? I'm going to invite Lane and the worship team up, and we're going to sing. And I want you to reflect. I want you to understand. I want you to challenge yourselves with this idea, who am I following? And is it a place that I want to stay? Do I want to continue to follow this person or this truth or this reality, this teaching? Or is there maybe a shift that needs to happen? It's like, no, nope, now it's time for me to start following the truth, to start following Jesus Christ. If you have never said yes, if you have never said, I, you know, I want to follow Jesus Christ, I invite you to come up to the stage. You can kneel and pray. You don't have to do that. If you'd rather stay where you're at and you want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine. If you don't want to talk to me, shoot me an email. We have these connect cards in there, okay? You can do that. Leave that on your chair. I'll contact you. Very, you know, non-threatening that way. I just want you to understand, this is the most important decision we ever face. For many of us, we've chosen to follow Christ. We have to face, like, now, am I following Christ today? What does my life look like today? It's got to start. Just like the Ethiopian did, it's got to start. Somewhere. Who we become starts with who we're following. So who, it is it, who is it that you're following? Let's worship. Let's stand and sing this last song together. We were the fallen, the runaway kind, lost in the shadows. 
shadows Desperate for life But you came from death to join you in life now we are the rich born of resurrection buried here with Christ raised and walking through that someone here is here because of a divine appointment. That's possible. And if that's the case, if that's you this morning, you know that the Lord's doing a work, and don't leave without making that decision like the Ethiopian did to say yes to Christ. I'm telling you, choosing to follow Christ doesn't make everything in your life go well and smooth and happy, but it gives you a hope. That's beyond hope for a future that we may not even know is there. It, it, it's something that we, we find hope in the fact that Jesus Christ has saved us from that which we cannot save ourselves. We find it in this hope that, that we can be re- reunited with him for eternity and a hope that we have hope. So if you're here and that you know that this is a divine appointment, I just want to take advantage of that divine appointment. The Holy Spirit has brought you here for that purpose. Let's pray. Lord, 
Thank you that you have brought us here. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this scripture. And we see how Philip has followed you. We see how the Ethiopian chose to follow you. And Lord, I just, it's hard to live in this culture, in this world, and to follow you, and, and especially to follow you well. And so I, I repent and I ask for your forgiveness that I have not followed you well. And I ask that your spirit will lead me into these divine appointments where, where I will find myself saying yes and obeying where it is that you're leading, that I will follow you where it is that you're taking me. Lord, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for the forgiveness that you have brought, for the salvation that you have brought, that you have saved us from that which only you can save us from. That's the gospel. And then you call us to follow you and I pray that we will say yes to follow you. It's hard because we'll face other things that will draw our attention that, hey, follow me, follow me, follow me, and we want to set those aside and first and foremost follow you so that I can come to the point where I can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Or let that resonate in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to stay and connect with one another over some coffee and some snacks. And a grow groups will start at about 11 o'clock.